In this series of videos, we're going to look at mass spectrometry, which is a technique that gives us insight into the molecular mass of a sample and gives us some structural information as molecules fragment into smaller pieces that we can then characterize. We're also going to talk about the process of structure determination as a whole. And actually, mass spectrometry is going to give us a taste of organic reactivity under very high energy conditions, which gets a little bit complicated in talking about fragmentation reactions. That said, Keep in mind that a lot of the information from a mass spectrum overlaps and reinforces what you find in other spectra. And so, while we will talk a lot about fragmentation reactions, you can reinforce and double-check fragmentation products using other aspects of other spectra. Mass spectrometry isn't really true spectroscopy in the sense that it doesn't involve the use of light. Instead, it's built on the idea that ionization gives us a level of control over molecules that allows us to characterize their mass. Because ionized or charged molecules move with different speeds in an electric or magnetic field, ionization in an electric or magnetic field leads to differential motion. And by measuring this differential motion, we can determine mass. And this is the essence of mass spectrometry. This mass information is useful to us. If you think through the spectra we've looked at already, the molecular formula has already been given in all of these problems, and so we know the molecular mass already in these problems. A lot of that information comes from mass spectrometry, as we'll see. We can divide every mass spectrometry experiment into three stages. In the first stage, the sample is ionized under high energy conditions, usually by, by bombarding the sample with many electrons. Irradiating the sample with electrons leads to the ejection of an electron from the sample, leading to this species here, which contains an odd number of electrons, meaning it contains an unpaired electron, and an overall positive charge. This species is called the molecular ion, and we usually represent it with a capital M, using the plus and the dot to represent the positive charge and the unpaired or radical electron, respectively. As the molecular ion travels to the detector, it then has the opportunity to fragment in the second stage, and this involves decomposition into smaller molecular pieces or fragments. Ionization methods in stage one can differ in how forcefully they ionize the sample, and this is often described in terms of hard versus soft conditions. Hard and soft conditions lead to different fragmentation patterns, with higher energy, more vigorous conditions leading to more fragmentation in general. There are situations, though, in which fragmentation is undesirable, especially when we're studying delicate, large-scale molecules like proteins, for example. And so soft ionization methods have their place as well. The third stage is the actual measurement of the masses of the ions created in the ionization and fragmentation stages. On a mass spectrum, the x-axis, rather than being frequency as it would be in a spectroscopy experiment, is mass-to-charge ratio, or m to z. The motion of a charged ion depends on both its mass and its charge, and so what mass spectrometry actually measures is this mass-to-charge ratio. In the vast majority of cases, the molecular ion and the fragments have a charge of plus one, meaning that we can read molar mass in grams per mole directly from a mass spectrum. In addition to seeing the molecular ion, we also see the masses of any fragments formed in the fragmentation process in the mass spectrum. And these may be cations with an even number of electrons, or may be radical cations themselves, like the molecular ion, as we'll see in future discussions of fragmentation. The y-axis in a mass spectrum is intensity, or the number of ions with that corresponding mass-to-charge ratio on the x-axis. Peak heights in mass spectrometry don't tell us a whole lot, except that an ion exists at that mass-to-charge ratio. And so generally, we're going to focus on the x-axis when analyzing mass spectra. The actual design of a mass spectrometry instrument is based on this idea that we can control the paths of ions using electric or magnetic fields. The instrument shown here uses a magnetic field. On the left, the sample enters through this input tube and is vaporized and ionized using an electron beam in what's called an electron impact mass spectrometry experiment. The ions thus produced are accelerated through an electric field this way and then are bent by a magnetic field, and the extent of bending depends on the mass of the ions. Heavier ions, or those really with a larger mass-to-charge ratio, are bent less than lighter ions with a lower mass-to-charge ratio. The ions then strike a detector whose purpose in life is to measure m over z based on the angle of deflection through this magnetic field, whose strength is, of course, known. The resulting graph, called a mass spectrum, plots relative intensity on the y-axis 
and mass to charge ratio on the x-axis. And as we just mentioned, we generally don't pay so much attention to the peak heights in mass spectrometry. It's more about where we find peaks along the x-axis. The peak at highest mass to charge ratio, ignoring isotope effects, which we'll talk about later, is known as the molecular ion peak, or capital M. But because of fragmentation, this is not always the most intense peak. Intuitively, it seems like it should be, right? Since the molecule just ionizes and no further reactivity would just give rise to a molecular ion peak. The other peaks in the spectrum are due to fragmentation. And you want to pay attention to where you see high intensity fragmentations. This peak that has the highest relative intensity, and we can tell that what's plotted is relative intensity since this is defined as 100, is what's known as the base peak. What the base peak tells us is the most predominant ion in the sample after ionization and fragmentation. And this may be a fragment. It's not always the molecular ion. So be careful not to confuse the molecular ion peak, which you're going to find on the right side of the spectrum, and the base peak, which simply has the highest relative intensity. The first thing you always want to do when analyzing a mass spectrum is identifying the molecular ion and its associated mass to charge ratio. But to extract useful information from a mass spectrum and develop accurate intuition and pattern recognition skills with mass spectrometry, you then want to analyze the fragments. And the way to analyze the fragments is to look at their relation to the molecular ion peak. How many mass units are they away from the molecular ion peak M? We can represent this using m minus something, where the minus something is the difference in mass between the fragment and the molecular ion. For example, the first fragment here is at 42 units, which we can think of as m minus 18. The minus 18 tells us the that the molecular ion has lost a neutral fragment that is 18 mass units, 18 grams per mole, assuming that all of the ions here have a charge of plus one. That number 18 is a number that you'll see appear in multiple places. And if we look at the structure of the molecule that gave rise to this spectrum, it's not terribly difficult to see where the 18 grams per mole comes from. And I'll let you think about that on your own. The base peak is associated with a fragment that we can label as M minus 29, since it appears at 31 and the molecular ion appears at 60. And here again, this number 29 is one that you'll see appear in multiple spectra on a regular basis and we can identify it with a substructure within this molecule. 